Good evening and welcome to Publish and Be Damned, Series 1, Episode 8. We are continuing our look at the Stoics uh, with our read-through of Seneca's Letters of a from a Stoic this evening. Um, tonight I do have a guest with me and that is Iron Duke. Hello. Uh, hello, people. How are you going? Uh, how are you at the moment, Iron Duke? How are things? Oh, I'm pretty good. Uh, it's spring. How long? Um, oh, the weather's very nice. been, the weather's not been very good so far. To be honest with you, it's raining constantly. Yesterday it was overcast. Uh, yeah, all together. Yes, well, we're we're heading into autumn, so it's uh, it's starting to get cold. I'm starting to have to think about putting the heating on. Um, I just hope you don't get too many power yeah. cuts. <laughs> it could be an interesting winter, couldn't it? Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but then, of course, they've kind of encouraged power cuts by freezing the price at a lower than market rate. So we shall see. <laughs> oh, look, I, I think this one is going to be extremely interesting. Uh, to be honest with you, I think it's going to be yes. very, very interesting. You might need uh, all your your learnings from the Stoics, right, to get through. But, um... Yeah. <laughs> But, okay, so we are we are back this evening with the Stoics, and I have a quote for today, which I think is quite a good one. It is from Epictetus. So Epictetus says, the key is to keep in company only with people who uplift you, whose presence calls forth your best. Uh, I think that's probably quite an important thing in life in general. But probably particularly so at the moment with the way the world is. I think, you know, people like Don the Pleb who are encouraging communities to gather around themselves and uh, and 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 looking to surround themselves with good people are probably on the right track. Much to be said for some positivity. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, we return to Letters from a Stoic, and we are on letter number 54. Um, I'm, I will say right from the start that I'm not sure how long this episode will be tonight. I have a bit of a rough throat, so we'll see how my voice holds out. But um, we'll just uh, take it easy and see how we get on. This might be a, might be a pertinent letter. So letter 54. Ill health, which has granted me quite a long spell of leave, has attacked me without warning again. What kind of ill health, you'll be asking? And well you may, for there isn't a single kind I haven't experienced. There's one particular ailment, though, for which I've always been singled out, so to speak. I see no reason why I should call it by its Greek name, uh, its medical name being asthma, um, difficulty in breathing being a perfectly good way of describing it. Its onslaught is of very brief duration, quite like a squall. It is generally over within the hour. One could hardly, after all, expect anyone to keep on drawing his last breath for long, could one? I've been visited by all the troublesome or dangerous complaints there are, and none of them, in my opinion, is more unpleasant than this one, which is hardly surprising, is it, when you consider that, with anything else, you're merely ill, while with this you're constantly at your last gasp. This is why doctors have nicknamed it rehearsing death, since sooner or later the breath does just what it's been trying to do all those times. Do you imagine that as I write this I must be feeling in high spirits at having escaped this time? No, it would be just as absurd for me to feel overjoyed uh, at its being over, um, as if this meant I was a healthy man again, as it would be for a person to think he had won his case on obtaining an extension of time before trial. Even as I fought for breath, though, I never ceased to find comfort in cheerful and courageous reflections. What's this? I said. So death is having all these tries at me, is he? Let him then. I had a try at him long, a long while ago myself. When was this, you'll say? Well, before I was born. Death is just not being. What that is like, I know already. It will be the same after me as it was before me. If there is any torment in the latter state, there must have also been torment in the period before we saw the light of day, yet we never felt conscious of any distress then. I ask you, 
wouldn't you say that anyone who took the view that a lamp was worse off when it was put out than before it was lit was an utter idiot? We too are lit and put out. We suffer somewhat in the intervening period, but at either end of it there is a deep tranquillity. For unless I'm mistaken, we are wrong, my dear Lucilius, in holding that death follows after, when in fact it proceeds as well as succeeds. Death is all that was before us. What does it matter, after all, whether you cease to be or never be again, um, when the result of either is that you do not exist? I keep on talking to myself in these and similar terms, silently, needless to say, words being out of the question. Then, little by little, the affliction in my breathing, which was coming to be little more than a panting now, came on at longer intervals and slackened away. It has lasted on all the same, and in spite of the passing of this attack, my breathing is not yet coming naturally. I feel a sort of catch and hesitation in it. Let it do as it pleases, though, so long as the sighs aren't heartfelt. You can feel assured on my score of this. I shall not be afraid when the last hour comes. I'm already prepared, not planning as much as a day ahead. The man, though, whom you should admire and imitate, is one who finds it a joy to live, and in spite of that, is not reluctant to die. For where's the virtue in going out when you're already being thrown out? And yet there is this virtue about my case. I'm in the process of being thrown out, certainly. But the manner of it is as if I were going out. And the reason why it never happens to a wise man is that being thrown out signifies expulsion from a place one is reluctant to depart from and there is nothing the wise man does reluctantly. He escapes necessity because he wills what necessity is going to force on him. Um, I uh, Kind of a, a humorous uh, anecdote. So today I, I, I did the usual shopping at the end of the week, and um, I uh, <laughs> there was a rather browbeaten man in the queue behind me uh, being verbally accosted by his missus for some of the things he decided to put in the trolley um, she was suggesting to him that perhaps he was uh, going to be shortening his life by uh, some of the items he was buying. And uh, as, as she went away to go get something else, he just looked at me and said, well, I'm, I'm going to die at some point anyway. I might as well have, <laughs> it might as well enjoy myself. A man under the arrow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't couldn't be that guy. It was it was quite. I nearly burst out laughing. I'm not ashamed to say. Um, so what do you, what do you make of that chapter then, Angie? Uh, it makes a great deal of sense. Um, I would say, in terms of asthma, that which is vastly more prevalent these days than it used to be. Um, and and I, what I have heard is that part of the reason for it is so few people today have contact with animals. You know, like back in the old well, days, every, everyone had cats and dogs, and a lot of people had contact with horses, and obviously in more rural areas, cows and pigs and sheep. I, I mean, but, but basically, you're right. I mean, it's meant to be more prevalent as a result of modern living. So there's lots of things that people think um, may influence the prevalence of asthma so you're absolutely right um, people's exposure to animals at a young age there's also a link between uh, allergies in youth and um, um, uh, antibiotics treatment with antibiotics before the age of one yeah i can um, believe that yeah, yeah absolutely it's, and it's someone to... like um, someone like seneca who was a very upper class bro Yes. Um, pro probably would have been much more akin to a modern person than the vast majority of people in the ancient world. Yeah, I mean, uh, I still think e even even as a wealthy Roman, you're probably exposed to a degree of exposure that oh, you look, know, look, you're, people you're, 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 aren't today. Yeah, you're you're going to be exposed, obviously, to horses if you're a, if you're a upper class Roman. Um, probably to dogs because the Romans were as keen on dogs as, as we are today. Um, you know, most Romans have guard dogs and whatnot. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, uh, but I, I, that's what I've heard anyway, is that, and, and certainly, I know my son, uh, we always had that, like, birds and dogs and what have you, um, and, and cats as well. And all I mean, uh, and he, he never got asthma, so. 
Yeah, maybe. I mean, I, I come from a family where myself and my father, we don't have asthma, but my mother and my sister did. I, I don't think my sister particularly suffers with it now. It was more of a childhood thing, but um, my mum still does, but she finds it's worse when she uh, she drinks dairy. Um, oh, okay. Well, so the Romans she, she gave up dairy entirely. Well, the Romans wouldn't have suffered from that because the Romans didn't really drink milk. So. No. No, but interesting. But I, I, I think but given... They did, they did like cheese. They did like cheese. Mm. Well, I think, you know, it, it's, it's interesting because I think at, at some point we all... And, you know, I... I'm not as young as I was. I'm still, I'm still relatively young, but I can recognise the fact that, uh, you know, some things that seemed easy sort of five, ten years ago, and, and you know, I can still do them. They're still relatively easy, but they're not quite as easy as they were. Um, tell me and, about you know, it. Mate. Tell me about. It. <laughs> there comes a there comes a point where you you know whether you like it or not, you're kind of forced to confront your mortality, and I think. I don't. I, I, I have things that concern me about my own mortality, but they're not. They're not a concern. You know, it, it's like oh, making sure my wife and my son are looked after if, if, if in the event that you know I For exit sure. this earth before I plan to. That's that's my only concern, really. I, I think. You know, obviously, I may change my tune when the time does eventually come. But uh, you know, for me, I've never held a particularly great fear. And I think, you know, I, I'm a I'm a Christian, so I I kind of hold on to the belief that there's something in the hereafter. But I, I think what Seneca says there is absolutely correct. I mean, even if there isn't, like you've experienced non-existence before, and it wasn't painful. So yeah, you know. yeah, no, I agree with that. Look, I, I'm 58 next spring your time mm -hmm. uh and um yeah i mean look there are there are I, like you say i can still do most of the things i used to do but there are some things i can't do i, I find it difficult to run run fast for a mile now <laughs> you know <laughs> um i got buggered knees from being in the army and uh, i'm half deaf in one ear and, kind of stuff and yeah you do as you get older and also the other thing of course that happens as you get older is you see more and more people you knew dying so you mm. know I, I wonder so again being being religious and and being a fairly committed religious person i i would often go with my dad to visit you know people in our church that would be ill and and quite regularly dying you know there was a lot of elderly people in our church when i was a kid and you know one thing elderly people do is they get to the point where they uh <laughs> cease to exist and um you know i i went and and saw quite a lot of elderly people at the end of their lives in hospital and it it i think it we i think we talked last time about the kind of the lack of visibility of death yeah. in the modern age because we're just not exposed to it as regularly as you were in the past and i think out of that is bred of a, a fear of of death i oh, look I don't, I don't want to derail your stream here thomas no, I, I would just like to say like i watched the the queen's funeral like i'm sure many of us did mm -hmm. yeah, um same. and i was appalled at the people clapping and cheering oh uh, yeah that it's is like, that is a, well this is, it's a, it's out of awkwardness because they don't know what to do they don't understand because they've not been exposed to it but i mean you know if, if you look at photographs and even the film of earlier royal funerals men took their hats off mm -hmm. because that's respectful and and, that, and everyone maintained a dignified silence that's that's the British way, at least that you did. Exactly. Yeah, I found I it mean, very. Un, I mean, I said in my Discord, it was just uncouth. It's just. It, it was, yeah, I mean, look, I went to my dad's funeral, uh, and like, if someone had clapped or cheered at my father's funeral, I would have been highly tempted to punch them. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's, sorry, it's just not what you do. <laughs> so, I, I I just thought it was it, 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 what what that showed was how fallen so many of the british public are and i'm not having a go at them because they did turn out and good 
and they were vastly, all, the vast majority of the people did turn out for Anglo Celtic, of course. Um, and I'm not having a go at them from that point of view, but like they just haven't been taught about this. Mm -hmm. No. Um, yeah, you know, I certainly wouldn't have been there clapping and cheering. Um, I, would have, I, would have, yeah. I would have taken my hat off, which I noticed a lot of blokes didn't do, because that's what you do. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, um, I, I took my son to a place tonight and I said, you know, make sure when you go in, he, he likes to wear a baseball cap. And I said, you know, when you get inside, make sure to take your hat off. And he was like, but why? They say it's okay. And I said, well, because it's just polite to take your hat off when you're indoors. And he's like, yeah. but why? And I just said, I don't know. It just is. Just do it. Oh, I, I look, John, it's, it's, uh, another side aside, I, I really get on my nerves when I watch British movies. British movies, where mm -hmm. people in the military salute without a hat on. In the British military, you cannot salute if you don't have some sort of headgear on. Okay. You, like, if, you, if you're bareheaded, you can't salute in the British Army. You can, I believe, in the American, American uh, forces. Is there any particular reason for that? Or? Well, because you're touching your cap, really. Right, that's, okay. That's where it came from. So if you, if you don't have some sort of headgear on, be it a tin helmet or, or um, uh, like a beret or whatever, you, you cannot salute in the British Army. You can, you, all you can do is come to attention, which you do. Mm. For a senior, for a senior officer, obviously, um, but you can't salute. You just can't. And yet, constantly, I see British movies where blokes with no hat on salute because they think the Americans do, and they haven't bothered looking at what the British tradition is at all. Mm. That's interesting. I, I didn't know that. That's um, yeah. well, no. Uh, no was, to be honest, I think I had heard that, but um, it, you know, not being in the army and not being in the habit of saluting, it's obviously not. Uh, you not can't salute. That concerns me. If you're in the British Armed Forces, and it doesn't matter which arm of them you are, it can be the Army, the Air Force, the Royal Navy, or the Royal Marines, you cannot salute okay. in the British Armed Forces unless you have some sort of headgear on. Standards, people. Standards. Yes. British. Right, standards. Yes, the best kind. Uh, letter 55. I've just this moment returned from a ride in my sedan chair, feeling as tired as if I'd walked the whole distance instead of being seated all the way. Even to be carried for any length of time is hard work, and all the more so, I dare say, because it is unnatural, nature having given us legs with which to do our own walking, just as she gave us eyes with which to do our own seeing. Soft living imposes on us the penalty of debility. We cease to be able to do the things that we've long been grudging about doing. However, I was needing to give my body a shaking up, either to dislodge some phlegm, perhaps, that had collected in my throat, or to have some thickness uh, due to one cause or another in my actual breathing reduced by the motion, which I've noticed before has done me some good. So I deliberately continued the ride for quite a long way, with the beach itself tempting me onwards. It sweeps round between Cume and Servilius Vatia's country house in a sort of narrow causeway with the sea on one side and a lagoon on the other a recent storm had left it firm for as you know a fast running heavy surf makes a beach flat and smooth while a longish period of calm weather leads to a disintegration of the surface with the disappearance of the moisture that binds the particles of sand together i had started looking around me in my usual way to see whether i could find anything i could turn to good account and my eyes turned to the house which had once belonged to Vatia. This was the place where Vatia passed the latter part of her life, his life, his life. A wealthy man who had held the office of Praetor, but was famed for nothing but his life of retirement, and considered a fortunate man on that ground alone. For whenever a man was ruined through being a friend of Asinius Gallus, or an enemy of Sejanus, or devoted to Sejanus, for it came to be as dangerous to have been been a follower of his as it was to cross him. Perhaps he used to exclaim, Vatia, you're not the only person who knows how to live. What in fact he knew how to hide, what in fact he knew was how to hide rather than how to live. And there is a lot of difference between your life being a retiring one and its being a spineless one. I never used to pass this house while Vatia was alive without saying, here lieth Vatia. 
Good philosophy, my dear Lucilius, is such a holy thing and inspires so much respect that even something that resembles it has a specious appeal. Let a man retire, and the common crowd will think of him as leading a life apart, free of all cares, self-contented, living for himself, when in fact not one of those blessings can be won by anyone other than the philosopher. He alone knows how to live for himself. He is the one, in fact, who knows the fundamental thing, how to live. The person who has run away from the world and his fellow men, whose exile is due to the unsuccessful outcome of his own desires, who is unable to endure the sight of others more fortunate, who has taken to some place of hiding in his alarm like a timid, inert animal, he is not living for himself, but for his belly and his sleep and his passions, in utter degradation, in other words. The fact that a person is living for nobody does not automatically mean that he is living for himself. Still, a persevering steadfastness of purpose counts for a lot, so that even inertia, if stubbornly maintained, may carry a certain weight. I can't give you any accurate information about the house itself. I only know that the front of it and the parts in view, the parts that it displays even to passers-by, there are two artificial grottos, considerable feats of engineering, each as big as the most spacious hall, one of them not letting in the sun at all, and the other retaining it right up until its setting. There is a grove of plain trees through the middle of which runs a stream, flowing alternately, like a tide race, into the sea and into the Acherusian Lake, a stream capable of supporting a stock of fish even if constantly exploited, it is left alone, though, when the sea is open. Only when bad weather gives the fishermen a holiday do they lay hands on the ready supply. But the most advantageous feature of the house is that it has bay next door. It enjoys all the amenities of that resort and is free from its disadvantages. I can speak for those attractions from personal knowledge, and I'm quite prepared to believe, too, that it is an all-year-round house, since it lies in the path of... The western breeze, catching it to such an extent as to exclude Baye from the benefit of it. Vatia seems to have been no fool in choosing this place as the one in which he would spend his retirement, sluggish and senile as that retirement has become. The place one's in, though, doesn't make any contribution to peace of mind. It's the spirit that makes everything agreeable to oneself. I've seen for myself people sunk in gloom in cheerful and delightful country houses, and people in completely secluded surroundings who looked as if they were run off their feet. So there's no reason why you should feel that you're not as much at rest in your mind as you might be just because you're not here in Campania. Why aren't you, for that matter? Transmit your thoughts all the way here. There's nothing to stop you enjoying the company of absent friends as often as you like, too, and for as long as you like. This pleasure in their company, and there is no greater pleasure, is one which we enjoy the more when we're absent from one another, for having our friends present makes us spoilt. As a result of our talking and walking and sitting together every now and then, on being separated, we haven't a thought for those we've just been seeing. One good reason, too, why we should endure the absence patiently is the fact that every one of us is absent to a great extent from his friends even when they are around, Count up in this connection first the nights spent away from one another, then the different engagements that keep each one busy. Then the time passed in the privacy of one's study and in trips into the country, and you'll see that periods abroad don't deprive us of so very much. Possession of a friend should be with the spirit. The spirit is never absent. It sees daily whoever it likes. So share with me my studies, my meals, my walks. Life would be restricted indeed if there were any barrier to our imaginations. I see you, my dear Lucilius. I hear you at this very moment. I feel so very much with you that I wonder whether I shouldn't start writing you notes rather than letters. What's he, what's he saying in there? That was a bit of a, a long and meandering one. Um, I, I think what he was trying to allude to was it doesn't matter where you are. Um, your own mood mm -hmm. and, and whether you're positive or not is, is, it's not dependent on where you are 
it's it's interesting because again I, i'm going to kind of draw on on my son here my son being a, a young boy who's who's kind of not had his imagination crushed out of him by you know the the state schooling system it, it's really interesting to see how he can find fun anywhere and with anything like yeah you know and i think yeah i think that's kind of what it's hinting at maybe not necessarily fun as such but you know that kind of peace of mind and strength well, of character it's not someone, dependent on your surroundings necessarily yeah for, for i mean obviously children uh, are still still have that innocence that they can do that I, I think for somebody like seneca it's more enjoyment perhaps than fun mm -hmm. Uh, or satisfaction, even sometimes, if, if you're doing something intellectual, I suppose. Uh, I mean, look, one of the things that this very clearly shows is that the modern idea that all people before us were more stupid than we are is absolutely ridiculous. I mean, Seneca is obviously a very intelligent human being, and were he alive today, he would still be a very intelligent human being, you know. <laughs> Although, uh, perhaps I, not in a way that would be appreciated by the, much of the modern day. Oh, I don't know. I mean, look, look, by the more sane of us, I think he would. Be. Well, yes. Uh, but there's a lot of insanity in the modern day, of course. But, yeah. But, I mean, I think that's what he's trying to say. I mean, look, I've, I've lived in several different continents. Um, and, yeah, where you are doesn't necessarily... Like, I remember when I was <coughs> a very young man, I thought, ah, oh, yeah, to be in Africa would be great. You know, and mm -hmm. yeah, sometimes it is. Um, you know, and I, when I was a, a young chap, like maybe, I don't know, 15 or 16, I thought, oh, wouldn't it be great to be in Australia? And like having been in those places, sometimes it's great and sometimes it's you no know, better than anywhere else, you know. It just mm -hmm. depends on what you're doing. And, uh, like even uh, mine, yeah. Yeah, it's 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 like that. Uh, but yeah, I, I I would urge people to realise that the the ancients and the people who came before us were not more stupid than us. No, they I mean that's the kind of whole Whig view of history, which is we're proceeding from darkness into ever greater light, and I think it's, it's a load of rubbish. It's absolute absolute nonsense. I mean, Seneca would be a highly intelligent man now, just as he was two thousand years ago. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. Okay. Letter 56. I cannot for the life of me see that quiet is as necessary to a per is as necessary to a person who has shut himself away to do some studying as it is usually thought to be. Here am I with a babble of noise going on all about me. I have lodgings right over a public bathhouse. Now imagine to yourself every kind of sound that gets that can get you hating your years. When the strenuous types are doing their exercises, swinging weight-laden hands about, I hear the grunting as they toil away, or go through the motions of toiling away. That sounds um, like the just lift bros, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, very much like the gym bros. Yeah, <laughs> some of them, some of them. To be fair, yes. some of, some are more serious. But yeah. Um, sorry, or, or going through the motions of toiling away at them, and the hissings and strident gasps every time they expel their pent up breath. When my attention turns to a less active fellow who is contenting himself with an ordinary, inexpensive massage. I hear the smack of a hand pummeling his shoulders, the sound varying according as it comes down flat or cupped. But if on top of this some ball player comes along and starts shouting out the score, one's done for. Now add someone starting up a brawl and someone else caught thieving, and the fellow who likes the sound of his voice in the bath, and the people who leap into the pool with a tremendous splash, going beyond from those sounds which are, if nothing else, natural, Call to mind the hair remover, repeatedly giving vent to his shrill and penetrating cry, the better to advertise his presence, never silent, unless it be while he is plucking someone's armpits and making the client yell for him. Then think of the various cries of the men selling drinks, and the ones selling sausages, and the other selling pa pastries, and all the ones hawking for the catering shops, each publicising his wares with a distinctive cry of his own. 
You must be made of iron, you may say, or else hard of hearing, if your mind is unaffected by all this babble of discordant noises around you. When continual good morning greetings were enough to finish off the stoic Chrysippus. But I swear I no more notice all this roar of noise than I do the sound of waves or falling water. Even if I am here told the story of a people on the Nile who moved their capital solely because they could not stand the thundering of a cataract. Voices, I think, are more inclined to distract one than general noise. Noise merely fills one's ears, battering away at them, whilst voices are actually catch one's attention. Among the things which create a racket all around me without distracting me at all, I include the carriages hurrying by in the street, the carpenter who works in the same block, a man in the neighbourhood who soars, and this fellow tuning horns and flutes at the tr- trickling fountain uh, at the trickling fountain and emitting blasts instead of music. I still find an intermittent noise more irritating than a continuous one, but by now I have so steeled myself against all these things that I can even put up with a coxswain's strident tones as he gives his oarsmen the rhythm for I force my mind to become self-absorbed and not to let outside things distract it. There can be absolute bedlam without, so long as there is no commotion within, so long as fear and desire are not at loggerheads, so long as meanness and extravagance are not at odds and harassing each other, for what is the good of having silence throughout the neighbourhood if one's emotions are in turmoil? The peaceful stillness of the night had lulled the rest, the world to rest, This is incorrect. There is no such thing as peaceful stillness, except where reason has lulled it to rest. Night does not remove our worries, it brings them to the surface. All it gives us is a change of anxieties. For even when people are asleep, they have dreams as troubled as their days. The only true serenity is the one which represents the free development of a sound mind. Look at the man whose quest for sleep demands absolute quiet from his spacious house. To prevent any sound disturbing his ears, every one of his host of slaves preserves total silence, and those who come anywhere near him walk on tiptoe. Naturally enough, he tosses from side to side, trying to snatch some fitful sleep in between the spells of fretting, and complains of having heard sounds where he has never heard them at all. And what do you suppose is the reason? His mind is a ferment. It is this which needs to be set at peace. Here is the mutiny that needs to be suppressed. The fact that the body is lying down is no reason for supposing that the mind is at peace. Rest is sometimes far from restful, hence our need to be stimulated into general activity and kept occupied and busy with pursuits of the right nature whenever we are victims of the sort of idleness that wearies of itself. When great military commanders notice indiscipline among their men, they suppress it by giving them work to do mounting expeditions to keep them actively employed. People who are really busy never have enough time to become skittish, and there is nothing so certain as the fact that the harmful consequences of inactivity are dissipated by activity. We commonly give the impression that the reasons for our having gone into political retirement are are, are our disgust with public life and our dissatisfaction with some congenial and unrewarding po- uncongenial and unrewarding post yet every now and then ambition rears its head again in the retreat into which we were really driven by our apprehensions and our waning interest for our ambition did not cease because it had been rooted out but merely because it had been tired or become piqued perhaps at its lack of success I would say the same about extravagant living, which appears on occasion to have left one, and then when it has, when one has declared for the simple life, places temptation in the way. In the middle of one's programme of frugality, it sets out after pleasures which had one, which one had discarded but not condemned, its pursuit of them indeed being all the more ardent the less one is aware of it. For when they are in the open vices, invariably. For when they are in the open vices, invariably take a more moderate form. Diseases too are on the way towards being cured when once they have broken out, instead of being latent and made their presence felt. So it is with the love of money, the love of power, and other maladies that affect minds of men. You may be sure that it is when they are 
when they abate and give every appearance of being cured, that they are at their most dangerous. We give the impression of being in retirement, and are nothing of the kind. For if we are genuine in this, if we have sounded the retreat and really turned away from the surface show, then as I was saying a little while ago, nothing will distract us. Men and birds together in full chorus will never break into our thinking, when that thinking is good and has at last come to be of a sure and steady character. The temperament that starts at the sound of a voice or chance noise in general is an unstable one, and one that has yet to attain inward detachment. It has an element of uneasiness in it, and an element of the rooted fear that makes a man prey to anxiety, as in the description given by our Virgil, which he goes on to give. And I, who formerly would never flinch at flying spears or serried ranks of Greeks, am now alarmed by every breeze and roused by every sound to nervousness, in fear for this companion and this load alike. Which is from the Aeneid. The earlier character here is the wise man, who knows no fear at the hurtling of missiles or the clashing of weapons uh, against weapons in the close-packed ranks or the thunderous noise of a city in destruction. The other, later one, has everything to learn. Fearing for his belongings, he pales at every noise. A single cry, whatever it is, prostrates him, being immediately taken for the yelling of the enemy. The slightest movement frightens him out of his life. His baggage makes him a coward. Pick out any one of your successful men, with all they trail or carry about with them, and you will have a picture of the man in fear for this companion and this load. You may be sure, then, that you are at last lulled to rest. When noise never reaches you, and when voice ne voices never shake you out of yourself, whether they be menacing or inviting, or just as meaningless hubbub of empty sound all around you. This is all very well, you may say, but isn't it sometimes a lot simpler just to keep away from the din? I concede that, and in fact it is the reason why I shall shortly be moving elsewhere. When I want what I wanted was to give myself a test and some practice. Why should I need to suffer the torture any longer than I want to, when Ulysses found so easy a remedy for his companions even against the sirens? Uh, and, and there's an asterisk there, and it says, Homer narrates in Book 12 of the Odyssey how the hero, following the advice of Circe, stops the ears of his crew with beeswax while they row past the place where the temptresses sing. Oh, right. Let's do one last letter. Did you did you want to make any comment on that one, Andrew, or are you happy to? Uh, well, look, I mean, again, he's, he's, he's talking about controlling oneself, basically, which is a lot of what stoicism is about. Or controlling one's thoughts, I guess, or more accurately. Um, mm -hmm. Look, I, I, where Seneca had an advantage on us in the modern world is that the noises that used to or could annoy him, although he says, says that they did not for the most part, um, were mostly kind of natural noises. I, don't, I, can, I can put up with anything except that most useless thing known to man, the, the leaf blower. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that is the only thing that drives me insane when people the, uh, the the power of moving one's leaves from one place to another for no purpose whatsoever yes <laughs> um, like <laughs> why um, it, that's about the only thing that really drives me yeah it's, it, it, it's interesting though I, th I think he's right so i've um I, I've, I've been in situations certainly where all the noise in the world hasn't been able to distract me from what i'm doing because i'm in a you know, I'm, I'm, I'm calm. I'm, my mind is well organized, and it's, it's, it's just in the peripheral. But I've also been in places where I'm, you know, having a really tough day with work, and any kind of noise is just, you know, my mind is disordered. Um, I'm under, you know, various pressures that I, you know, can't really get out of in the course of life, and I, I find, you know, any kind of sound is is terminably irritating. Yeah. Um, no, I totally agree. I, look, again, it just shows that there's not so much difference between Seneca and an intelligent one. 
No. But, fact, probably no difference whatsoever, I really. How, how do you think you you would you know you would maintain that ordered mind when uh, you know in the course well, of life it could be quite easy to become dis disordered. I, I think you look, as I said when you were talking just now about like when you're working on something important and you're concentrating, then it's relatively easy to ignore distractions. Um, he mentioned that there, didn't he? he? Kind of talked about the restless soldiers, and I'm sure you've you've got a familiarity yeah. with that. Like you know, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, there's, there's a lot of make work stuff in the military because idle hands are not a good thing. You know? But when they say idle hands, what they really mean is idle minds. Yes. Uh, you know, so they're trying to give people something to do, and there's a lot of that in the military, um, sadly. <laughs> well, but, I, mean, I that's, mean, that's because our military has, has become one that's less about bashing people over the heads and more about uh, and, 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 and taking land and more about trying to keep supposed peace in various places. Oh, there is that, but I, I think it's also, uh, a lot, actually, in, in, in some respects, the British Army is so small these days that there's less of that than there used to be. Because there I are can imagine, yeah. The jobs. But I, I would say this, I mean, like if like I was, I've been a platoon commander, like in action. And when you're a platoon commander and you've got 30 or so blokes. I was going to say, like, is that about 25 to 30 blokes, is it? Yeah, it's 30 or so guys. And, and, and when, you, when you've got like 30 or so guys under you and, and you're in action and the enemy are shooting at you, the, 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 you that calms your fear. Because you're more concerned about what you're trying to do for the 30 or so blacks than you are about the enemy eating you. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. okay. it, it, it's just, I, I don't even know how it happens, but it just does because you, like, you, you, you're trying to work out, well, look, I want this section over here and that section over there and this section's got to provide covering fire. And you're thinking about shit like that. You're not thinking about, oh, there's this twat over here trying to shoot me, you know? <laughs> so it's, <laughs> it, it is very much a mental thing. It just is. And it's all, this is where the Stoics get it right. Like almost everything about humans is what's going on in our brain, you know? Hmm. They, um, I, I've got a friend who's a who's a bit of a Buddhist, and he 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 talks about like meditation and stuff, and he talks about um, what they call monkey mind. And What's that? When you're, it, it's kind of like the surface level, um, the kind of part of yourself that that you know is always thinking about stuff and 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 can't just. Um, I, I'm probably explaining it quite badly, but when you're trying to meditate monkey mind is the kind of thing that's always kind of trying to push thoughts into your mind and yeah, yeah. distract I, I you of... from what you're doing and you know he, he says one of the things you've got to do is when you're meditating is you're taught to kind of give monkey mind something to do and, and that's the whole focus on the breathing thing uh -huh. um, and, and that that keeps your mind that that keeps that part of your mind focused on that so that you can uh, pursue the the other benefits of meditation, I guess. And that's, that's how perhaps you would describe it. John, did you, have you heard of this thing where by a lot of modern people apparently don't have any kind of internal discourse? I, I've not. It, it, this apparently I find that very strange because for me, yeah. I, I, I'm always kind of, uh, this probably sounds a bit mental, but I'm always kind of talking to myself in my head and, and yeah, thinking yeah, things exactly. through and examining things. And Yeah, exactly. You know, but, and apparently there are large proportions of the modern population who don't even understand what that is, you know, where you're pros that, and cons in your head about things. Is that because they're kind of constantly, um, you know, uh, they're kind of constantly being distracted by stuff so they can't you know they're always in front of the tv or they're always you know there's no there's no time where they just have there's no time where they're just alone with themselves and their mind yeah I, I, maybe i don't know i just don't understand it at all i mean i can't understand I, it, it's beyond me that any human being doesn't have an internal discourse going on in there most of the time <laughs> 
no, I, I, you know, I wouldn't. <laughs> I would find that very strange. Just to, just, I, I guess what 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 happens? You're like you, you kind of get through the day and wonder what what happened in the day, kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, bro, it would be like that. You're some kind of wraith. You know, you you would be like the only things going into your brain well, are external. You, I guess, you're a biological robot who is purely. Um, motivated by, or not motivated, but purely controlled, I guess, or but by by these inputs, by these external inputs, rather than having any kind of um, self thought. It's it's like you know, I I see these young people these days, and like when they're out, if they're on a train or in a car or in a bus or whatever they might be doing, walking through a shopping mall. They're constantly on their phone, you know, uh, and playing confess. some game. Yeah. It's insane. To me. Well, this is what I mean. Like that, that, people today are constantly distracted by something. There's never a moment where it's just them and their thoughts. Why? Well, yeah. I'm getting to, I'm getting to the stage where a lot of modern people don't have any thoughts. But you know, <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, getting... there's no room for them, is there? Because they're yeah. plugged into a phone or they're watching. Yeah. Watching if, a TV if, program, or you know, if you don't have an internal discourse, how the hell can you work out your own opinions on anything? It's like beyond me. <laughs> well, how can you navigate life? I mean, <laughs> every decision you make, it, uh, as far as I'm concerned, is by the product of internal discourse. Yeah, you you go look. If I do this, this will happen, and if I do this, this might happen, and if I do another thing. So and so might happen, and you have to judge that stuff. That's that's what your brain is for, for God's sake. Are, are people not faced with those kind of challenges? Because I mean, you know, I, I don't have. I, I would say I have no internal discourse when it comes to breakfast, for example, because I just have the same thing every day. So I don't even think about it. It's just I do it automatically. So you you don't even on Sunday think, well, today I'm going to have a cook breakfast, for example. Uh, well, no. To be honest, on Saturdays and Sundays, I might skip it entirely. Yeah, let's see. Look, I, I sometimes eat breakfast, and if I do, it's always, well, almost always, like bacon and eggs and so on. Um, mm -hmm. But but I, 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 I very seldom eat lunch. Very seldom. I guess what I'm trying to say is have people's lives been reduced down to such a mundane place that there is no need for that thought? I don't know, man. I, like I said, I, I just, it's, it's insane to me that someone doesn't have. You, you, you think about it like. The, the, in their head. the modern, the modern kind of job where one is, um, you know, everything's basically a production line and a human being is, is simply, uh, you know, simply a robot on the production line performing one specific thing over and over again in a very repetitive manner. They go home, they plug into the TV it, on the way to and from work. They're on their phone. There's no kind of, um, there's no kind of uh, meaningful changes within their life. Like, you know, if, if, if you're a farmer and you have to work to the seasons and, and stuff, you know, you're, you're always having to think, right, you know, it's, it's, it's winter. What do I do now? It's, it's spring. What do I do now? Um, it, because it's cyclical. And there's, and you, you also, there's an element of having to think about it rather than just doing, like I say, the same thing every day over and over again. And, and you've also got to understand about um, various crops and various animals yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, th there's a lot to think about, uh, and even if you're a blacksmith, you know, you've got to think about, you know, what is it my customers are going to want, and uh, uh, and and to make that stuff, you have to think about how, what you're doing. Um, yeah. Mate, I don't know. I look. I once had a job where my all I did all day was to make sand molds for okay. great, great big massive locks great big massive iron locks mm -hmm. and all i did was fill this mold up with sand and then pass it on to somebody else who did something else and i did that job for a week and a half because it was driving me insane mm -hmm. like, i mean I, um, it was, my... it was quite well paid but like i just couldn't do that well, for eight my, hours my granddad for most of his life did 
did various types of piecework on production lines in the Midlands uh, yep. in, in varying places. And then he said to me, look, you know, anyone with half a brain. And, you know, he, I wouldn't have said he was like a super intelligent bloke, but he, he's, he's not stupid either. Yep. Um, and he, he kind of, you know, I think I get the impression that anyone with half a brain just has to invent ways of, um, uh, ways of uh, making that job. Uh, I'm trying to think of the way to describe it. You know, it's, it's like when I worked retail and you'd you'd play you'd play little games with yourself in your head to kind of keep yourself your, your brain yeah. occupied because otherwise you're just insane. Yeah, I, that, that's exactly what I was going to say, John. The only way you could survive that kind of work is is if you were doing mental stuff in here. Yeah, well, this is the thing. Like when I when I worked retail, I did it for like nine years. I mean, physically, my body was in the building, and I was going through the motions of stacking shelves or serving on till or whatever. But my my mind was not in that building. Oh. Um, it couldn't have been. I'd have I'd have gone insane. I I, I think there's yeah. something something about that kind of work that just is not conducive to well mental well-being and in the human psyche i just i can't you know i i think if i if i'd been in that building mentally i, I think i'd have been insane maybe i did go insane. I mean, look, look look at it this way john like uh, relatively speaking in evolutionary terms humans are fairly young yes. as, as a species and we started off as hunter gatherers. Now, if you were a bloke and, and you're part of a hunting party, think of all the thousand things you've got to constantly think about in, in order to be a successful hunter. And even for women, if they're gathering stuff, you know, they have to think about stuff. But I'm, look, I'm a bloke, so I think of it from a bloke's point of view. Mm -hmm. And like, as a bloke, as part of a hunting party, and you're trying to hunt, I don't know, woolly mammoths or woolly yeah, whatever it is yeah yeah some, kind of, but you, some you, kind of wild dangerous wild animal with a load of other dangerous wild animals or, knocking about or, or even deer and what have you there's a thousand things you've got to constantly think about and that's what the human brain is designed to do mm. yeah this modern uh, modern living is not exactly conducive to that is it but uh... For sure, maybe, but, uh, maybe that's maybe that's why people have lost that internal monologue because they just it, it, it's not necessary in modern life. But uh, you know. I, I was just amazed when I read it. Like pe people, have, they did this survey. I think it was in the US, but I'm not absolutely yeah. sure. But they did this survey, and something like thirty or thirty-five percent people said, "No, I, I never do that," mm. which. It was just weird to me. I'd like it gobsmacked me. It really did. I, I wonder if they they did any kind of expanded study where they actually like measured brain patterns or something to kind of see whether you know they did it, but they just weren't aware of it. Or I, I don't know, man. Like I, I could believe that there is a tiny proportion of real thickers who really don't have any sort of internal monologue. I can't believe it's 30, 35% of people. Was it done in America? Because I could kind of believe that. Yeah, I think it was done in America. <laughs> I, 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 I just find that hard to believe. I just do it. Like mm. I've, every time I look at something, I mean, particularly like if I'm walking around and I see an old statue or a nice old building or something like that, I'm, I'm thinking, who built that? Why did they build it? Yeah, you know, yeah. So, uh, yeah. I'm also as well like talking about this hunting thing. I'm always like, <laughs> maybe I'm just a, a naturally jumpy person, but I'm always kind of assessing. Oh, you know, there's a crowd over there. Do I need to avoid them, or you know, all that kind of stuff? <laughs> yeah, look, I, I used to certainly do that when I was out with my wife and my son and stuff like that. I certainly mm -hmm. did. That. Yeah, I think that again is perfectly natural. Um, and what good like should do, but you know, I, I don't know. Interesting. I might have to look into that. It's a, let's read one final letter this evening. Fifty-eight, and uh, we'll call it a day after that. 
I am very sorry to hear of your friend Flaucus' death. Still, I would not I would not have you grieve unduly over it. I can scarcely venture to demand that you should not grieve at all, and yet I am convinced that it is a better that it is better that way. But who will ever be granted that strength of character unless he be a man already lifted far out of fortune's reach? Even he will feel a twinge of pain when a thing like this happens, but only a twinge. As for us, we can be pardoned for having given way to tears, so long as they do not they have not run down in excessive quantities, and we have checked them for ourselves. When one has lost a friend, one's eyes should be neither dry nor streaming. Tears, yes, there should be, but not lamentation. Can you find the rule I am laying down, a harsh one, when the greatest of Greek poets has restricted to a single day, no more, a person's right to cry? In the passage where he tells us that even Niobe remembered to eat, this is uh, Homer's Iliad, would you like to know what lies behind extravagant weeping and wailing? In our tears, we are trying to find means of proving that we feel the loss. We are not being governed by our grief, but parading it. No one ever goes into mourning for the benefit merely of himself. Oh, the miserable folly of it all, that there should be an element of ostentation in grief. Come now, you will be asking, are you saying that I should forget a person who has been a friend? Well, you are not proposing to keep him very long in your memory, if his memory is to last just as long as your grief. At any moment, something or other will happen that will turn that long face of yours into a smiling one. I do not see very much time going by before the sense of loss is mitigated and even the keenest sorrowing settle down. Your face will cease to be its present picture of sadness as soon as you take your eyes off yourself. At the moment, you are keeping a watch on your grief, but even as you do, it is fading away, and the keener it is, the quicker it is in stopping. Let us see to it that the reconciliation of those we have lost becomes a pleasure to us. Uh, the recollection of those we have lost becomes a pleasure to us. Nobody really cares to cast his mind back to something which he is never going to think of without pain. Inevitable as it is that the names of, of persons who were dear to us and are now lost should cause us a gnawing sort of pain when we think of them. That pain is not without a pleasure of its own. As my teacher Attalus used to say, in the pleasure we find in the memory uh, of departed friends there is a resemblance to the way in which certain bitter fruits are agreeable or the very acidity of an exceedingly old wine has its attraction but after a certain interval all that pained us is obliterated and the enjoyment comes to us unalloyed if we are to believe him thinking of friends who are alive and well is like feasting on cakes and honey Recalling those who are gone is pleasant, but not without a touch of sourness. Who would deny, though, that even acid things like this, with a harshness in their taste, do stimulate the palate? Personally, I do not agree with him there. Thinking of departed friends is to me something sweet and mellow, for when I have them, I, when I had them with me, it was with the feeling that, they, that I was going to lose them. And now that I have lost them, I keep the feeling that I have them with me still. So, my dear Lucilius, behave in keeping with your usual fair-mindedness and stop misinterpreting the kindness of fortune she has given as well as taken away. Let us therefore go all out to make the most of friends, since no one can tell how long we shall have the opportunity. Let us just think how often we leave them behind when we are setting out on some long journey or other or how often we fail to see them when we are staying in the same area, and we shall realise that we have lost all too much time while they are still alive. Can you stand people who treat their friends with complete neglect and then mourn them to distraction, never caring about anyone unless they have lost them? And the reason they lament them so extravagantly then is that they are afraid people may wonder whether they did, whether they did care. They are looking for belated means of demonstrating their devotion. If we have other friend, other, if we have other friends, we are hardly kind or appreciative of them if they count for so very little. When it comes to consoling us for the one we have buried, if we have no friends, we have done ourselves a greater injury than fortune has done us. 
She has deprived us of a single friend, but we have deprived ourselves of every friend we have failed to make. A person, moreover, who has not been able to care about more than one friend, cannot have cared even about that one too much. Supposing someone lost his one and only shirt in a robbery, would you not think him an utter idiot if he chose to bewail his loss rather than look about for some more means of keeping out the cold and find something to put over his shoulders? You have buried someone you loved, now look for someone to love. It is better to make good the loss of a friend than to cry over him. What I am about to go on to say is, I know, a commonplace, but I am not going to omit it merely because everyone has said it. Even a person who has not deliberately put an end to his grief finds an end to it in the passing of time, and merely growing weary of sorrowing is quite, quite shameful as a means of curing sorrow in the case of an enlightened man. I should prefer to see you abandoning grief than it abandoning you. Much as you may wish to, you will not be able to keep it for very long, so give it up early as possible. For women, our forefathers fixed the period of mourning at a year, with the intention, not that women should continue mourning as long as that, but that they should not go on any longer. For men, no period is prescribed at all, because none would be decent. Yet out of all the pathetic female... <laughs> The pathetic females you know, of who were only dragged away from the graveside or even torn from the body itself with the greatest of difficulty, can you show me one whose tears lasted for a whole month? Nothing makes itself unpopular quite so quickly as a person's grief. When it is fresh, it attracts people to its side. It finds someone to offer it consolation. But if it is perpetuated, it becomes an object of ridicule, deservedly too for it is either feigned or foolish. And all this comes to you from me, the very man who wept for Aeneas Serenus, that dearest of friends to me, so unrestrainedly that I must needs be included, though this is the last thing I should want, among examples of men who have been defeated by grief. Nevertheless, I condemn today the way I behave then. I realise now that my sorrowing in the way I did was mainly due to the fact that I had never considered the possibility of his dying before me. That he was younger than I was, a good deal so, was all that ever occurred to me, as if fate paid any regard to seniority. So let us bear it constantly in mind that those who are we are fond of are just as liable to death as we are ourselves. What I should have said before was, my friend Serenus is younger than I am, but what difference does that make? He should die later than me, but it is quite possible he would die before me. It was just because I did not do so that fortune caught me unprepared with that sudden blow. Now I bear it in mind, not only that all things are liable to death, but that the liability is governed by no set rules. Whatever can happen at any time can happen today. Let us reflect then, my dearest Lucilius, that we ourselves shall not be long in reaching the place we mourn his having reached. Perhaps, too, if only there is truth in the story told by sages, and some welcoming abode awaits us, he whom we suppose to be dead and gone has merely been sent on ahead. I think that is a really pertinent chapter to today, because much in the way that... Um, um, much in the way that various inadequacies have become things to parade as if they were uh, something special or something um, you know of value I think excessive grief has also become such um, I, <laughs> I'm a bit of a hard uh, taskmaster with my poor little boy when it comes to tears uh, <laughs> I don't know about you, Iron Duke, having raised a, a son yourself, but I, 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 find, I find myself after sort of five minutes going, okay, that's enough now. You, you've 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 done you you've done your crying. Let's uh, move on. Yeah, I, I used to call him my brave little soldier and talk to him. That's what I used to say to him. Is that what was that? Sorry. When my son was small, like mm -hmm. five, six, seven. Uh, if he cried about something, I used to call him my brave little soldier, and soldiers don't cry. <laughs> exactly. 
exactly. It's it's interesting, isn't it? I, uh... And it worked. It did work. Like at first, my, my wife was against that, but she gradually realised that yeah, it did work. I, I think it's obviously a sentiment that has existed for many, many years. It's um, a bad thing. It's a bad thing. It's, well, it's, I mean, it's teaching your son to be a man. Well, so no, 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 no one likes crying men. They don't. Women don't even like crying women. Um, this is, I can't remember who said it. It might, it might have been Jordan. Jordan Peterson, who basically said, like, um, you know, uh, don't, it, it was kind of along the lines of don't waste too much time telling people all your troubles because half the people you tell are happy that you're struggling and the other half couldn't care less. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Like, right. yeah. I mean, look, I mean, it, it is better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. That is mm -hmm. absolutely true. Um, but, Look, in the military, people die, okay? And, and what we do is we'll have a drink to those guys. We may or may not have some sort of ceremony for them. And, and we don't forget them, but we move on because, you know, you're in the military and military guys get killed. Um, and I think that's quite helpful. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting. I, I'll bring Pal in, into this again, but when that, uh, MP was killed by um, the IRA. I can't think of his name off the top of my head. Powell kind of said something in. Um, I can't. I'm not going to be able to remember exactly what he said, but he said something which most MPs acted aghast at. Like they couldn't believe he'd said it. And like basically, this MP's wife apparently understood exactly what he meant because they. He was speaking basically from his experience in the military and it was kind of like you know basically all this it, all this is ridiculous and this how isn't how he'd want to be remembered basically yeah yeah i mean look bear in mind you know pal was the youngest brigadier in the british army in world war ii yes but a bit briefly yeah but he was uh, and yeah I, um, and pal was pretty traditional british bloke in most respects um and yeah, look, in the military, you know, um, in my regiment when I was in the SADF in South Africa, if, if one of our dudes got killed, um, we we would have a drink to them. We had a song that we used to play in the bar, uh, and everyone had their own uh, pint glass, and mm -hmm. we'd smash it, smash it, and put the handle bit back up on the on, on the. On on the thing and that was it but wouldn't mean we would never think of them again but it was like it was a ceremony and, and that was it it's gone it, it's it's interesting there that he um seneca kind of said look all that grief is not for you it's for it's for show it's for other people yeah. like yeah. you're like you're trying to sh demonstrate to them that you you have the appropriate response to what's happened and it's like I, I don't know John are you old enough to remember Princess Diana's funeral? I, I am I unfortunately my mother forced us to watch it. Oh my god. I, my 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 mum was a was a Diana fan, I think. Yeah well look, I'm not and I never was <laughs> you know, I think she was a slut basically. But um uh, I, it sickened me. It was so not British and of course Tony Blair organized the whole damn thing. Yes. Yes, he did. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the vile traitor Tony Blair, who I would happily slow hang in Minecraft. No, in Minecraft. Minecraft is, in Minecraft is, um, but yeah, uh, I did sicken me. It was so not loud, British, but I, uh, and for someone who didn't deserve it in the least. Yeah. Um, um, I'm, 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 Seneca I'm, is Seneca's right on what he was saying. I, I, I don't have a problem in admitting that I would say I was a relatively emotional man. I, I can be moved to something approaching tears by certain pieces of music and stuff if I'm, you know, thinking about certain things. But I don't, I, I don't generally give myself over to sobbing and weeping and wailing, like, you know, a, a tear in the corner of the eye kind of thing. Yeah, John, I shed a tear twice watching the queen's funeral 
Right, fair enough. I, I think I was close. Well, Definitely well, close. I, I shed a tear twice watching the Queen's funeral. Once was um, it was more to do with the military stuff around it, and the uh, last time was when her coffin was disappearing into the ground, and I did. I shed a tear. Didn't weep for a while. I shed a tear. But of course, having any kind of restraint is toxic masculinity, and we should be ashamed of ourselves for encouraging a generation of men not to be in touch with their emotions like they're well, females. Apparently, the new James Bond is going to be a soy boy. So, although how he's going to be James Bond with a short soy boy, I don't understand. Oh, I, 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 I just think we are facing a, a, a mass ranks of lefty liberal people. You don't want masculine men, and particularly you don't want masculine it's, straight. It's straight it's white interesting, men. isn't it, how they talk a big talk about representation and about diversity, but actually they're chronically afraid of any representation for traditional men or any diversity that includes traditional men. Or particularly traditional straight white men. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. So, absolutely true. <clears throat> but again, like I said. The, the, that last letter, letter from Seneca, totally based, uh, and again, just shows he would be an intelligent man today, just as he was 2000 years ago. I agree. We, we, human brain well, power has not improved well, much. Truth, truth is truth, no matter what time you're in. 100%. 100%. problem we've got today is we're not being taught truth, we're being taught someone's version of, of the quote-unquote truth. Well, we're being told lies. Oh, yeah, exactly. well, that's why I said someone's version of the truth, which is not the actual well, truth. Have you seen that, have you seen that uh, documentary, What is a Woman? Is that the, is it Michael Knowles, is it, or yeah, someone's I think, I think it's, that, uh, it's not bad. I mean, it's I've very... Seen clips. I've seen some clips, and it looks quite good. Yeah, you can find it on... on um, Various places like bit shooting, but um, yeah, it's pretty good. I mean, it's it's, it's normy values, but yeah, it's, it's pretty good because, and eventually it ends up coming back to this dude's wife who immediately explains what a woman is very easily. <laughs> <laughs> this it's, dude's it's not, wife, it's not hard, so, um, who's also a mother, of course. But yeah, <laughs> it, it, it's not hard for anyone that's remotely sane. Well, there is the problem, John. Remotely saying. Yeah. I mean, today we have people teaching in schools with gigantic pairs of fake breasts on, and they let them teach little kids. I'm sorry. There is, a, oh, there, is there are a number of reasons that I'm very glad we homeschool. <laughs> it's just home, insane, home educate. Right? It's insanity. I um, and it's so obviously insanity. I, I I would encourage any men to do whatever they can to make sure that uh, they can provide for a family. Um, John, so I've, I've, got, I've got to ask you one thing before we stop, because I know you, you didn't want to go much beyond it now, because your voice is too good. Um, Liz Truss, all right? Now, Liz Truss was originally SDP, I think. Are we are we are we going modern politics? Because I'd, I'd I'd be keen to avoid very, that on the show. Very, but if I'm on very, if I'm on your show tomorrow, I'll happily answer. answer oh, the just very just very briefly, I'm not going to go into this in depth. But she was originally SDP, wasn't she? Uh, I thought she was Liberal Democrat. Oh, sorry, Lib Dem. Yeah, big pardon. Now she she was an anti monarchist Yes. She was a Remainer. Yes. He's most certainly a feminist. Quite probably. Uh, well, she is, you know. But uh, how is she in any way, shape, or form actually conservative? I just don't understand. Uh, well, this is what I think people... I mean, partly what I think people need to understand is that um, all this... Uh, all these ideas that we can somehow combine UKIP... Uh, the, the Brexit Party and Heritage Party, and I, I think that's nonsense. I think the route to power in in Britain is is via either the Conservative Party or the Labour Party, and I think many people have recognised that. 
and that's why you've ended up with people in the Conservative Party that aren't really Conservatives, but they they know that it's a route to 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 obtain power for themselves. And then my other thing would have would be, I guess, is that you know. I, I can't say for certain if she she has changed her opinion on any of that, any one of those things. What I would say is that, like me, she grew up in a household that was very, um, uh, well, socialist, shall we say. Um, she, and, she's a woman, she's a woman. Well, <laughs> she, she grew up in a house with, with, with parents who would take her to... Uh, uh, anti-war protests and um, nuclear disarmament yeah. protests and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, she she grew up with parents with certain values, and those values do rub off on their children. And you know, when yeah. I, yeah. I, I I you know I am a product of that, and my views today are very different to how they were when I was a child. So, I'm not saying it's impossible for her to have changed. I just don't know if she has or not. Yeah, no, fair enough. Look, well, well, like you said, if you, if you come on the street tomorrow, we'll talk about this a bit more. But um, me, I find that strange, you see, because like, my, my family were always um, conservative. Um, although, actually, my grandfather voted Labour once or twice, but he was socially totally conservative. Um, but my dad was a Thatcher voter, I was a Thatcher voter. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, I, so, I don't know. Yes, my, yes. my mum tends to vote green, so that kind of... Yeah, I don't know, man. But yeah, all right. Like, like you said, this is taking off course a bit. But yeah, Seneca, base bloke. Absolutely a base bloke. We, we shall keep reading for his other pearls of wisdom, I think. We've, we've still got quite a few weeks worth of him before we get on to Aurelius. Cool, cool. And Marcus Aurelius is my favourite room in Sad about the sun, so you know, I can't bugger up. these people can bugger up, you know. Yes, yeah, okay. I, well, thank he, you very much for joining. He did try his best, Marcus Aurelius. He tried to give his son the best tutors. The dude just wasn't interested. In well, it just goes to show you that you know, we're not blank slates, and there is some element of nature as opposed to just nurture as well. Yeah, and, and I'm one of those people who thinks Marcus Aurelius' his wife wasn't a very good lady. So. Well, I mean, that's again, you, you could argue that was, that was Marcus Aurelius' choice. In, uh, but in was it? it? Was it, though? I, I'm not sure it was. was it, wasn't wasn't that uh, pretty much an arranged marriage? Oh, perhaps. Perhaps. Yeah, all right. Well, we'll, we'll get to that when we get to it, I guess. But, yeah, interesting. Man. Seneca... Seneca is like I don't know him as well as you do, but like yeah, very very interesting, good bloke. Well, I don't know him much at all. This is my first read through of it, so it's all new to me. I mean, I, I kind of know some of his background and stuff with Nero and and so on. But... Yeah, same. So uh, anyway, thank you for anyone who watches this, either who has persevered this evening or who watches this back some other time. If you make it to the end and you haven't already subscribed to the channel. Please can I encourage you to do so. Um, Iron Duke's YouTube channel will be in the description just as soon as I finish up the video. And um, we look forward to you joining us again next week. Thanks very much, Iron Duke. Have a good evening. Same to you, man. Thank you. Oh, um, sorry, before we go, is there anything you'd like to shill? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there is one thing. Um, I was supposed to do a stream yesterday with Horace and Adam about British foreign policy um, from the about 1938 to 1942, mm -hmm. British foreign defense policy, and we didn't manage to do it through assorted miscommunications. But we will do it next Thursday at 8 p.m. UK time. Okay, okay. There you go. So if you if you follow the link that will be in the description by the time this video is finished, um, you'll be able to to tune into those to subscribe and, and and watch that but um th thanks everyone for joining us thanks on for joining me have a good evening good night